Many have tried to claim that they are the James Bond of learning, but there is really only one contender for that title. Taylor. Don Taylor. Welcome to The Learning Hack, a podcast about the people and technologies that are creating the future of learning. I'm John Hellman. Now, guess what? Learning is cool. Learning is cool. Learning is cool. Learning is cool. Learning is fun. Knowledge is power. Knowledge. Education. Learning. My guest on the Learning Hack podcast this time is so well known in our world, so enviably high profile that he needs no introduction. But we're going to give him one anyway. Hack Facts. Don Taylor is chair of the Learning Technologies Conference of the Learning and Skills Group of the Learning and Performance Institute, Network Chair of Emerge Education, Editor of Inside Learning Technologies magazine and Non-Executive Director of Filtered. His loveliness goes on and on. He is an influential organiser, writer, researcher in the field of adult learning skills and technology. Each year since 2013, he has produced his L&D Global Sentiment Survey, asking the question, what will be hot in workplace L&D next year? So, Jay Curtis, Head of Themes, what searching questions did I ask Mr Taylor, whom I had seated over a pool of deadly piranha fish as I menacingly stroked my white Persian cat in my high-backed chair? None of that happened. John, most of the interview was about the results of this year's Global Sentiment Survey, how it reflects regional differences, attitudes of vendors as opposed to buyers of technology, and what it tells us about L&D's response to the pandemic. However, you also managed to touch on Don's origin story and how he came to be so widely known and respected in the learning world. I've been a keen follower of Donald's survey over the years. It's a big help in planning the topics we feature on The Learning Hack. And Donald has been very helpful with the podcast in many other ways too, for which we're really grateful. I was particularly glad of the opportunity to discuss the results of this year's survey with him. As ever, it provides a fascinating snapshot of what is going on in the minds of all you learning people as you face the challenges of a disrupted, sometimes frightening world. So, Donald, welcome to The Learning Hack. Your global sentiment surveys always generate a lot of interest. It's become a big fixture in the L&D calendar. But for people who maybe aren't so aware of it as hacks like me, can you tell us what it is and how it came about? I can't believe that there's nobody who's aware of it, John. But let's assume that uh, there may be some people. Um, came about 10 years ago. Just thought it'd be an idea to find out what people have on their mind for the following year. And it's evolved over the course of nine years into something which, as you say, I think is part of the calendar for the year. I ask one question, which is obligatory, and two other questions which are optional. And from that, I then have a look at what I think the trends are going to be in learning development, maybe that year, but also in the future. The question I ask is, what will be hot in learning development in the workplace in 2022, for example? And that might seem like a trivial question, but when you have several years of data of that, and you've got several thousand people responding to it, you do start to notice trends. And the other data which we pick up also from the survey software tells us where people are, so we don't have to ask them what city or country they're in, we know that. The other two voluntary questions are, what will be challenging you this year? To which about 40% of people respond. And where do you work? Which about 80% of people respond to. So we get a pretty good response to those three quite short questions. And the, the what is obligatory question is a choice of three options from a list of 15. Okay. We well, see, I learned something there because I've been following this. I didn't realise you asked three questions. Yeah. Okay. Are. So the trends. What's hot? What's not? What is the survey telling us this year? We have to be very careful, John, with the idea that um, what people say is hot is going to be hot. Doesn't There isn't necessarily a correlation there. 
And I just want to talk about the survey population before I answer the question. Mm -hmm. The survey population is 3,500 people from 112 countries, and it is self-selecting. So if I put out the question, what will be hot this year? Well, um, people choose whether to answer it or not. They're asked to respond by email and via social media. So the people who respond are those who are already technically in tune with the world because they're used to doing that sort of thing. There are also people who are quite excited about new trends and so on. So the idea, and I think it's a justifiable hypothesis, is that the people who respond to the survey tend to be, if you are you know, familiar with the Everett Rogers diffusion of innovation curve, the idea is that these people are largely innovators and early adopters. So when I ask them the question, what's going to be hot, I don't necessarily assume that their response tells me what will be hot this year, because they're not everybody. And mm -hmm. they may have some fanciful ideas about what's important that other people, particularly the early majority, won't take kindly to and won't adopt. So what I'm looking for when I ask the question, what's hot, is what do these people feel excited about? Because then I want to know well, which of these many things that they get they think are important which of those things will transfer across to the early majority so with that in mind mm -hmm. let's look at what the survey says and then i'll give you my view on whether that's going to go mainstream or not does that sound sensible yes it does yeah. <laughs> all right so basically if you if if you're not bothered about what's hot you're just you know i'm just doing my stuff I've got these jobs to do. I'm not particularly bothered about what, you know, all, all that froth that's going on in the blogosphere. Yeah. You're not going to answer the question. You're not so. going to answer the question, no. And, and and by the way, by the way, this doesn't mean that this person's view, who's just getting on with their job, is not important. On the contrary, it's, it's very mm. important. Um, but they're not going to respond to the survey. Now, here's the thing, right? Let's say there are five things. Let's say each year there are 15 things people choose from. Um, and... Of those, how many do we think is going to get adopted by the mainstream? My guess is it might be, I don't know, two or three in the long term get adopted by the mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, because we know that most things that are new don't get adopted. Otherwise, we can't, otherwise, you'd go to the supermarket and you wouldn't recognize any brands from the brands you had five years earlier, for example. So we know that when you're trying to introduce something new, it takes quite a lot of effort to do it. Hmm. So that's why I'm interested in this, because it shows us what the what the froth is, but also there is substance behind that froth sometimes. And it's trying to find the substance, the cappuccino um, espresso underneath the froth on top. That's the exciting bit about the survey, the interpretation. Um, so d does that make sense? Yes. So tell us what's hot, what's not. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> There's another caveat I'm going to come to in a minute. Okay, so the, the worldwide population says reskilling and upskilling is hot. That's number one this survey. Mm -hmm. It was number one last year. Um, number two this year is collaborative and social learning. And that was the same last year, but it's gone up from last year by a small amount. Number three going down from last year um, is personalization. Coaching mentoring is up and learning analytics is down. Now, just to summarize what's happening there, what's happening is a lot of people have looked at those results and said, well, it looks to me as if the human side of learning, collaboration, coaching are going up, and the, the inhuman technical side, uh, personalization, learning analytics are coming down, and that there's this overall theme of reskilling and upskilling which remains dominant, which is true. Mm -hmm. But I think it's more complicated than that. I think that um, collaboration, social learning, and coaching and mentoring are on the way up and by the way, they're on the way up this year and they were on the way up last year as well, which is important. So it, the general theme, sorry, the general trend over years in the survey is that something will go up and then come down because something is hot, but then after a while, either it becomes business as usual or it becomes stuff that people are thinking is a good idea, but they can't really work out how to make it work so something that's become business as usual mobile delivery something mm -hmm. that's a good idea but we can't figure out how to make it work curation for example which mm -hmm. both of which fall follow the arc downwards if something's actually going up on the curve up on the tables year on year 
particularly two years in a row, it means that there is an opinion amongst the majority of people responding that this is becoming increasingly important. And that is true for collaboration and coaching and mentoring. But I think that both of these are being supported by technology to make them effective. Okay, coaching and mentoring has been around for a while though, hasn't it? Uh, Absolutely. But what's interesting about coaching and mentoring today, John, is that there's a, I mean, okay, firstly, it's been around forever. It is a fabulous method of helping people learn. It is ultra non-scalable, and that's been the problem with it. Oh, okay. Now, what's happening now is that people are using, and there are there's a lot of money being going into coaching, mentoring startups, and well, and scale ups in the past year or so. What's happening is organisations are using technology in a variety of ways to support it, either to set up a marketplace internally in organisations so people can find coaches more easily, or to help the coaches with some technical support so you don't have to do follow-ups all the time something automated does that for you or even to help you with the coaching itself so that you are providing coaching some of the time but an algorithm is also providing supporting coaching some of the time now with that technology coaching and mentoring goes from being the preserve of the few to being much more widely available and that's why it's an exciting prospect Mm. I do also think there's a bit of a pushback post-pandemic to people just wanting to be in touch with people, um, which is why collaboration and coaching are on the way up. I, I do think that's part of it. Um, and there's there's evidence for that. If you look in the question, when I ask people, what's your challenge this year? There's mm. been a lot of pushback, a lot of people saying, my challenge is around engagement. In fact, that was the biggest single bucket of 14 buckets that I characterize things in. That was the, the most, the biggest single category was engagement. A lot of people talking about the people they're trying to help learn being overworked, not being able to prioritize, and finding no time for learning in their day. Uh, and also screen fatigue uh, came up an awful lot. The idea of Zoom fatigue, uh, a lot of phrases suggesting people were tired of doing stuff online, which again, I think will probably support people in their vote for collaboration and coaching. That's a rather long answer, John. Does it make sense? Yeah, an interesting answer. There's quite a lot of stuff in there um, about the pandemic, I think. And it, it's mm. interesting, you know, when you talk about, about coaching and mentoring, on a more simple level, people have been using Zoom meetings quite a lot. Mm. But perhaps it's, perhaps coaching becomes more accessible because... You don't have to go to a certain place to do it. You know, yep. you, you just kind of set up a Zoom meeting. But more generally, can you, I mean, the last two years, these things have been affected by the pandemic. If you look at reskilling, upskilling, perhaps that is connected to the great resignation um, and the other skill shortages, issues we now have where um, people just can't get, it's not not that skills shortages are sectional like they used to be. You know, we can't get enough enough people who can, program AI for us, but you can't get enough lorry drivers, delivery drivers, you know, mm-hmm. skill shortage is a very widespread thing now. Um, and that's a, a, an instance perhaps of why that is kind of a, a number one. How can you, looking at this, what can you see of the influence of the pandemic? With reskilling and upskilling, you know, you have to look behind the numbers. I mean, all I've got is so many thousands of people, 12.5% of 3.5,000 people saying they think it's important. That's it. Plus, I've got the contextual stuff from the question about what are your challenges. But there's also contextual stuff that sits outside the survey that we can look at, and we can try to understand the world and interpret the results that way. Mm -hmm. The reskilling upskilling is an interesting example, because if you search that on Google Trends, you can see that it started taking off as a phrase in general circulation sometime in January 2019. And Mm -hmm. there, it was all about AI automation is going to take people's jobs. We have to reskill and upskill people in order to prepare them for the future of work. And there are a couple of things, but particularly the reskilling revolution report by the World Economic Forum in January 2020, which really sort of solidified and help people get their arms around this idea that it was about preparing people for the future of work. Of course, then the pandemic struck just after that report was issued. And then 
rapidly reskilling and upskilling by in a couple of months had become the solution to the pandemic after the pandemic people were all going to work differently and we had to reskill and upskill them for that now that might sound like it's a a solution in search of a problem. The first, the problem was automation. Then the problem was the pandemic. And who knows what it might be in the future. But if you look at it now, reskilling, upskilling, maybe it would be the solution to the great resignation, which actually a lot of people have been suggesting. But ultimately, it's not the issue that this is a solution in search of a problem. I think rather that there are many different organizations deploying the phrase reskilling and upskilling to mean many different things. And so it's a it's such a wide term that almost anything you can do can fall into it. Mm. And in a period of change where you notice you are doing different things and they seem to have large programmatic qualities to them and they are training people to do different things, you'll probably pluck that phrase out of the air because it seems to you like it characterizes what you're doing mm. and you stick it on what you're doing and say, yeah, that's what I'm doing, reskilling and upskilling. And you you don't realize that it's been part of what I call the ambient wordscape, part of the world of, of words that we inhabit that's been around for, well, now, um, three years, probably, two and a half mm. to three years, where everyone's been talking about it. So naturally, it's something you lean towards. I think it will die away as we get back to something closer to business as usual, and reskilling and upskilling becomes less something that people consider they're doing. They're not doing big programs, they're just trying to to grapple with the business of getting people trained in the post-pandemic world, which actually is a whole different question itself. And there's a, there's a whole lot of stuff in the survey results in that question about what your challenge is for this year. There's a whole lot of stuff around the, the practical challenges of working in organizations which were face-to-face went entirely online and are now trying to work in a hybrid way and don't quite know how to do do it that's going to be that's our for me reading between the lines and it's not on the list of things that's actually the biggest trend for this year just trying to go and stay hybrid i think to pick up on one aspect of that i'd like to have your answer there because there are a lot of ways we could go with that I'd like to drill into the question you ask a bit. It seems to me you could answer it in a couple of ways as a respondent. What's hot could mean, on the one hand, what's fashionable, as you said, you know, mm-hmm. what's hot, what's sexy, what are people talking about right now? Alternatively, you could take it to mean, what is there going to be a big demand for? What are we actually going to be doing a lot of next year? Um, those are two different things, aren't they? Last year's survey felt to me like it was reflecting the second of those two meanings in that suddenly there was a big demand for people um, in L&D to, to, to do stuff, uh, largely because of the pandemic. Um, does that distinction resonate with you? Mm. And do you see it in the results? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I do ask people to vote for what they think will be hot rather than what should be hot. So what yeah. they think is going gonna, is gonna to change rather than you know, what, what they'd like in an ideal world. Um, but it, it's it's very difficult to know people's intentions. In fact, it's impossible to know people's intentions from uh, a set of results in a comma-separated value file. I don't know what they were thinking when they chose one option over another. So I can't I can't really guess at the what's going on in people's heads when they vote. And I'm I'm wary to speculate because it's very easy to assume things about your voters and assume that numbers mean something and people do this all the time with surveys and I'd rather try to be explicit about what can be guessed or extrapolated from the data and what can't be and I I really you, you could say well if people mean this then this is what you can draw the conclusion you can draw but I'd rather not try to try to guess what is going on in people's heads I think it's I think it's dangerous yeah, I think in a way you just have to kind of lay it out and say, well, this was the question. This is what they said. Yeah. Going slightly off the um, the, 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 the pre-prepared questions now, I'm just looking at kind of, it, I feel like, um, you know, Alan Freeman saying hot in at number six. <laughs> I find it very difficult to stop myself doing the DJ voice when I... When yeah, I maybe we should do it. Kind of, <laughs> yeah. Tempted. Um, but it, it's interesting to see the things that, that, that kind of jump in seemingly out of nowhere. Skills-based talent management is in as a new trend. I, I suspect this is going to warm the, the, the cockles of the hearts of many a platform provider to know that 
skills-based talent management is is thought to be it it, it is thought to be new because they, there there are a lot of systems out there that do this. Mm. Mm. Um, to what extent are you kind of conscious of of the industry? You know, the supply side of the industry, which is obviously where I've spent a number of years mm. with this. So, I mean, if you look at something like the skills thing, sometimes these words. Um, mean different things and on the vendor side I think people began to talk about skills when they realized that competencies weren't working <laughs> that's kind of a, a a cynical take on that but but skills began to come big because it, it was like okay con people don't seem to be able to make competency make matrices matrices really work um, at scale and as a as a as a kind of feature of a learning system so now we've got skills taxonomies and folksonomies and so on what there is a question in here, Don, somewhere, which is, I think, to what extent do you see the the, the, the the vendor view within these and is it different from the, the buyer view? There's an awful lot in that question, John. Firstly, let's just look at what we, what we mean by skills-based talent management, which is typically a system which enables you to understand the skills of people, uh, skills required by jobs, uh, the resulting gap between them, and the job might be the job person's doing now, or the job somebody would like to do in the future, and the training or anything else, activities, experiences they might need in order to develop themselves for the future. Now, if you have that information, there is a tremendous amount you can do with it, and the promise of skills-based talent management platforms is that they transform how we not just learn at work, but do a whole bunch of other things as well, succession planning, human resource planning, uh, recruiting, and so on. And that's particularly in line with the future of work. So there's a, there's a lot behind it. Um, my own view about the competencies and the skills is I think it's very difficult to have any serious conversation about that that's based on definitions that is meaningful. And I'd rather simply talk about skills as if they were competencies and vice versa, because mm -hmm. frankly, that's how they're used interchangeably in most workplaces. Yeah. So have, have competency frameworks worked in the past? They have been deployed badly, but there have been places where they have worked well. And what's mm. happened now is that the technology and the methodology have apparently caught up with the promise of the past of competency systems. I say apparently because there are gaps. And in particular, there are issues about how you understand what skills somebody has got. Perhaps we can talk about that in a minute. But you asked this question about the voice of the vendor uh, and so on in uh, when it comes to that vote for, for skills-based talent management. Well, um, skills-based talent management is new in this week at, well, new in this year at number six with a vote of 7.2%. And that vote is actually pretty evenly distributed across each of the work groups that I looked at. I okay. essentially cut people into, into five different work groups. They work for L&D in an organization, that's the largest group. They're self-employed, they're vendors or their education or their other. And the, the vote, the lowest vote for that actually came from the self-employed. People in the workplace who were interested, 7.5%. Vendors, 7.9%. So it's very close. It's not like the vendors are leading the charge on that. Um, what's interesting is that the um, interpretation and what people want to get out of it may be different. We know that. I don't define the terms, and I do that quite deliberately because I know that when people vote for this, they're not going to read the definitions. And if I define them and I leave them to one side and then people vote, it gives an illusion that of certainty. It gives me an illusion they are actually voting for this thing I defined rather than what they have in their minds. But I'll tell you one thing I know is going to happen with this. There's an awful lot of promise around this. There's an awful lot of marketing spend around this. Hmm. Uh, I'm convinced that skills-based talent management platforms promise a lot. I'm convinced some of them can deliver a lot. I'm convinced that this will go up next year. And then as soon as it's on the way up, everyone will notice, vendors will charge in. And just as we've seen with AI, with learning experience platforms, with collaborative learning, it becomes a box that gets ticked in order to meet a procurement procedure. And it gets very diluted. And going from that peak of inflated expectations, we 
plunge down into the trough of disillusionment as people understand that actually, well, people come to think that it's not all it was cracked out to be just because a few vendors, probably quite a few vendors actually, have um, diluted the value. There are other things potentially which are contentious and problematic about this, but I think actually the thing that's going to be the most problematic in the, over the next two or three years will be the role of the marketplace that I've just described. The way we work has changed, and the way we learn is changing too. But 70% of organisations don't feel that their learning systems can really cope with all this change. It seems there is a disconnect between what learners need right now and what most learning suites provide. In a new white paper, Ben Betts and I tell the story of how this disconnect happened and lay out a vision of what a modern learning system ought to be and do. It's called Sweet Dreams and you can read it now. Meet the evolving nature of work with Cornerstone Explore, a holistic people growth experience that delivers a fully integrated, personalised journey of learning, skill development and career mobility for every person. I share all the ways Cornerstone Explore is designed and personalised for the ways your people want to grow and work, but this is only a 30 second ad. To learn how you can unite people growth with business success, visit csod.info slash future ready. So one feature in general about the, the, the survey now is, I wanted to ask about it. So the results are very diverse yeah. um, in the sense that no one opinion gets more than 12.5 percent this this year for instance so I mean it's not like you've got anything that's going to be kind of over 60 percent you know the majority of the industry is thinking about this uh, you know the most anyone gets around kind of 12 5 percent mm. um it, it seems to me that's probably because a function of the fact that it's an open-ended question you're not doing a multiple choice if you were to just give them five things to choose from you would get more. No, it is a multiple choice. You know, they, they have to choose three from 15. And oh, so right, OK. 13%, which is what reskilling and upskilling got last year, is by far the largest vote anything the top has had for uh, five years. In fact, it was, oh, it was, it was um, 2016 we last had something with that score on it. Actually, what happens is I've noticed that as the population increases each year of the number of people I get to vote, the overall vote at the top comes down and it's because the votes generally get more diverse mm. so you have a greater spread and so therefore the number of votes at the top sort of comes down a bit the, the pyramid if you like flattens mm. um now if something was overwhelmingly popular maybe would maybe would score more at the top but you know 12 and a half percent is is going to guarantee you a top slot you know, mm. the way it is at the moment that's one eighth of the votes that's one eighth of everybody voting chose that to be uh, one of their three things, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's not a huge number. You're right. What's much more interesting, John, probably is the diversity geographically and how mm. very different some places are from the other. That's why at the beginning I said this is the worldwide result, but it does vary absolutely across across geographies. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to make any kind of generalization about those differences like, <laughs> between the US and Europe? Um, I try not to. I try not to. But I, I find myself pulled into doing it, but I try not to because I, I don't want to be sucked into making uh, sort of crude cultural generalizations. But the classic, the classic mm. example is that the USA, sorry, North America, but it's dominated by the USA. North America always rates personalization higher than collaboration, um, whereas um, Brazil, which we've had in, in, uh, in for a couple of years now, always rates, well, in, in, over the two years it's been there, has always rated personaliza personalization much lower than collaboration. So mm -hmm. why is this? You might say, well, um, North America is an intensely uh, individualistic society, South America is a much more collaborative society. And, you know, if you look at this study, cross-cultural cross studies which have been done, um, th that does indicate that's true. But then if you go to India, personalization is ranked ahead of collaboration in India as well, which is also a more collaborative um, society. Now, I think the answer might be in that case that my sampling is wrong. I'm sampling a bunch of people who are very involved, possibly in a very large population of, of a billion people. I'm sampling just a few hundred people who've got a more bent towards the, the technical side of learning and development. That's quite possible. Mm -hmm. But it, that always causes me to be cautious about over generalizing 
about why one place votes for something more than another. The one thing I'm always prepared to say, though, is that Sweden always votes very highly for collaborative learning. And I've been told by Swedes themselves, this is a reflection of the Swedish and Northern European tradition of folkbildning, which is the tradition of continuous education after work, where people uh, help each other in study groups and so on. It's going back like 100 okay. years and so uh, in, in learning. Uh, after they've gone to school and after they've been at work, they continue doing it. So there's a strong tradition culturally, which I think we can legitimately say is the reason for that particular uh, that particular selection in Sweden. I can't find any reason, though, why in New Zealand, micro-learning always scores so highly. It's, it's, it, it, I, I don't know why. It always does. I've asked the New Zealanders. They don't know themselves and they keep voting for it. Who knows? Yeah, I was going to say something very facetious there about Lord of the Rings and trolls <laughs> and dwarves and things, but I, I mean, it's just going to either mystify people or upset them. Yeah, yeah. So that's cultural differences. Yeah. How about kind of speed of adoption? Because I, I was on a webinar the other day and, and someone said to me, you know, it is the case that the, the US is, is ahead of, of yeah. Europe and, you know, America sneezes, everybody else. Catches the cold. Is that true? John, I'm here to tell you that it is true. Uh, according to the uh, the survey results, the, the, we saw this most in 2016, 2017, uh, when in 2016, there was a big vote for micro learning in the US, a much lower vote for it in um, Europe. And then the following year, uh, Europe and the rest of the world voted more for microlearning and the vote fell dramatically in uh, USA. Ah, oh, interesting. And it was, uh, what had happened was a bunch of organisations had received funding to to really go into microlearning. They put a lot of word out about it in the US market and, and promoted it. And that had led to that being boosted in North America. And then after a year, the fuss died down. But the ripple came across and caught us now. It doesn't mean that's true all the time. And that's one particular mm. instance when you can look at a very clear historical pattern of why it happened. And you can, you can point the finger at exactly which money went into which organisations that spent how much money on press releases and so on, which inevitably must have led to an increase in the word microlearning in what I call the, um, the word landscape, the ambient word landscape. Um, mm. Doesn't mean it happens all the time, but... You know, it, 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 I haven't found any counterexamples of something exploding in Europe or India or elsewhere. Of course, there are mm. regional examples why things are sticky. South Africa voted very heavily this year for um, mobile delivery. Why? Well, mm. because uh, in many parts of Africa, and South Africa is one of them, um, the infrastructure isn't there for cable and for telef good telephony um, on landlines, but you can deliver stuff over your mobile. And so, mm. naturally, they're voting for mobile delivery as being one of their key things. Yeah, and they have mobile payments happening a lot. Mobile payments huge in Africa. Yeah, they're really ahead of the rest of the world with that. It comes to another thing, which is we talk about kind of, you know, in terms of doctrine curve, an east-west difference. How about a north-south dis difference, if, you know, between the kind of the, the, the richer north and the developing south? Does that show up at all? I haven't got enough data over enough time to confidently look at that but I am looking at it and there do seem to be some trends uh, one is the, the the greater vote for collaboration in the south versus the north but you know I'm 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 very wary, as you may have noticed, John, of trying to oversell any results. Mm. I get very tired if I'm on the stage at Learning Technologies, listening to somebody do a keynote and they wave their arms around. And they say, and this proves that dot, 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 when it doesn't. It's, a, it's, a, it's not just a leap from A to B to C. It's a leap from A to M or somewhere in the middle of the alphabet. There's no, there's mm. no, nothing, no substance behind it. Um, let me get some more data. Come back and talk to me in two years' time and I'll be a bit more confident. I do believe there are trends, but I want to have some more data behind me before I can answer that uh, solidly. I'm always very admiring of, of people who say, I don't know, <laughs> which you've just done. And <laughs> you it, admire so me, John, great. I have to say it all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's good. Rather than the, the extremely confident people um, yeah. who then turn out to be talking rubbish. I'd really like to ask about uh, what your beginnings were in getting into this industry and how you achieved your, your, your current 
um, situation of prominence within it. Where, how did you get involved in, uh, in in training and in technology? Which came first? Technology came first, then came training. Let me tell you how. I left yes. school, didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, my dad worked at home. Uh, I thought, you know, this, and this is 1981. And I thought to myself, um, there's interesting stuff going on, this computer thing. Went through the yellow pages, found all the local companies which had the word computer in their um, name, and I did a effectively a mail merge. I got a, I, I typed out a letter, and I replaced, and I typed out a different name, and I put the name on, stuck it on 14, 15 times on this bit of paper. No, it was 30 times actually, on a bit of paper, and sent them, sent these letters off to everybody. I got a job, being a computer programmer for a year. Uh, on a variety of things, basic, Fortran, uh, and machine code. And I realized I, mean, I could do it, but I wasn't very good at it. And I've subsequently learned that there is a very non-normal distribution in computer programmers. It's much more uh, a, long, a long tail distribution. Most people are okay. And I was one of those people who was okay. Well, there are some people who are 10, 20, possibly 100 times more effective than other people. Mm. I don't want to be okay. I want to be very good at what I do. But I got the technology stuff down. Went off, traveled for a year. Went off to university. Came out of university. Went to teaching English as a foreign language. So I learned how to actually control a class or work with a class of adults, help them learn something, and have been involved from that time in 1987 pretty much continuously in learning and technology in one form or another. But they really came together in 92 when I returned from, from Turkey where I'd been teaching and doing other things and saw a job advertisement in the newspaper. That's how things happened in those days. Mm. And I, I looked at it, I thought, that's me. The advert said, are you reasonably good at everything? I tried my hand at just about everything, <laughs> publishing, translating, selling, uh, being a computer program, a whole swathe of things. And I was a very good fit for this job. It was extraordinary how it's what's called um, retrospective coherence. The, this variety of things you've done leads you to a point where it makes sense. So I was the 24th person joining this startup and it was a very intense, enjoyable, uh, sometimes tough experience going from that startup to being the head of sales and marketing and the person in charge of the largest training center with a $12 million turnover in an organization which by then was several thousand, at least a thousand people and was international. So I, um, I learned a lot in that period. And one of the things that you, you said, how do I rate, get that period, of, that place of prominence? One of the things that happened to me when I was in this organization was that somebody recognized that I was a decent stand-in for the MD, even though when I'd only been there for like a year or two, I was sent in to represent the company in meetings at Microsoft, where this company was a very big um, player. And as a result of that, I got to meet a lot of other people who were in the same field and extended my network quite rapidly, quite early on. Come the internet or the World Wide Web Revolution, I should say, of the late 1990s, I was in a conference in Hamburg and I knew I was going to go and do something else. I knew that I was going to leave and set up my own company. And I had a whole plan for doing something which had nothing to do with training at all. And I sat and I looked around this room and there were, I don't know, how many hundreds of people in there? And I, I said, this is madness. I'm, I'm convinced myself that I can do this startup, but I have a resource here. All these people I know and I've got a good relationship with, why on earth am I trying to go into a different field? I should work with these people in learning and development and develop from there, which is what I ended up doing. And I think that was what catapulted me into a, in, from being a guy working for a company to a guy being, I don't know, you say in a position of prominence, I suppose I've developed that over, over the subsequent 22 years by associating myself with industry events and so on and trying to lead them and, and trying to be a servant to the people in the business who very often are working in isolation and need to hear from a voice from outside, which is reasonable and unbiased, and I hope helpful. That's a very good point. And something you hear again and again is that practitioners within companies uh, 
very often they speak a language nobody else in the organization does. Yeah. They know different stuff. They think different stuff. It's always great for them to um, get out and talk to people who do a similar thing in, in different places. Mm. And it's very much valued. And something you do really well, I think, is, is to bring people together to and to Thank unite you. a room um, and, the, and the various organizations that you do that. And that has led to as well to the to, to the report coming out, which we've been discussing. Can you tell people how they get the report? Just go to the website is the easiest way to do it. And from there, you'll see a, a flash or a link or something that points you to be able to download the resort. And the the uh, URL, of course, is donaldhtaylor.co.uk. Right. And I have another question that um, I know several people in the industry, well, many people in the industry will want me to ask and people have primed me to ask. <laughs> which is that with Daniel Craig stepping down from the Bond franchise, there there is a big job vacant you can see there. Um, can you give us a scoop on the learning hack? Have you had the call? Uh, John, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. You'd me. have to kill me. You'll yes. have to just okay. wait and find out. But let's just say I haven't been perhaps as prominent on, I don't know, some events recently as you might have expected. Who knows? Maybe I've been a little bit busy. On that bombshell. <laughs> Donald Taylor, thank you very much for coming on The Learning Hack. It's been a delight, John. Always good to chat, and I hope to do it again at some point in the future. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome to come back. Cheers. Thank you very much. Goodbye. That's all on The Learning Hack podcast for this time. Many thanks to Donald and to our sponsors, Learning Pool and Cornerstone. The Learning Hack is completely independent and transparently funded by sponsorship. If you want to help others find us, Please like, follow, rate, review and subscribe on your podcast platform of choice or on YouTube. Don't miss an upcoming episode here at The Learning Hack featuring the winner of this year's Rising Stars Award given by the LPI, Federico Brasicki. Till next time. Stay curious, learning people.